There are four Gospels that we rejoice in being able to proclaim. They never grow old. And this morning we ask you to turn to the third Gospel, Luke. Luke chapter 1 initially. We'll be in Matthew a little bit, but Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We sang this morning over the skies of Bethlehem, and the word Bethlehem, you know, as a child, it was almost a magical city, you know, when you would hear Bethlehem, because it was Christmas. I never thought of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, right? I didn't. It was Christmas, Bethlehem. I remember the only time that I have ever been in Bethlehem. A group of us went from the church in 1997, and I can remember when we went to Bethlehem, and um, uh, that morning we were actually supposed to go to Jericho on the schedule they give you. We were going to be in Jericho that morning, <clears throat> and the tour guide, right after breakfast, we're getting on the bus, he said, listen, everybody, we're not going to Jericho today, we are going to Bethlehem, so we did. Um, there was, it was a time where there was different little violent uprisings, protests going on. This is not rare in the Middle East and in Israel and the Palestinians and, and the Jews. And, and um, even in Bethlehem, we, we, they pulled us up pretty close to a gift shop so that we'd go in and shop. And it kind of just pointed to us, those are the hills of Bethlehem over there kind of situation. But, but uh, that night when we got back to the hotel, I flicked on the local you know, news and they were showing that there was kind of a violent uprising that day in Jericho. And I thought, that's interesting. That tour guide had to know that was going to happen, right? We were supposed to be in Jericho. He decided just to plan change plans. We're going to Bethlehem today. And that night on the news, we see that there was violence there in Jericho. And the next morning, I said to him, hey, you know, I know maybe you can't, like, give me any of your trade secrets, but did you know that was going to happen? You know, what was going to He said, well, you know, n nobody, the Palestinians, the Jews, they all like the tourists. Nobody wants to see the tourists go away. And so, you know, yes, they, they are made aware if there's going to be trouble, take your, you know, group somewhere else that day. Too bad most of life isn't that way. We live with uncertainty. We live in a, in a foggy world. We can't see very far ahead. We see a little bit ahead. We, if, if that car accident is three cars in front of us, we may, whoa, and be able to avoid it. But if it's a mile ahead of us, we're probably going to be sitting in traffic for a while, right? Right? We, we, we don't really get to see too far ahead in life and be able to divert our plans based on, you know, guaranteed knowledge. It may be that you went after that soccer ball early in the season, not knowing that the collision that was going to result from your effort would wipe you out for the rest of the year. And if you knew that, you might have said, I'll let him or her have that one so that I can play the rest of, of the season. We don't see far ahead. We live with uncertainty. We don't know if or when the Philadelphia Eagles fire Andy Reid. We don't know if the Eagles will be better without him or he'll be better without them, right? Right? <laughs> We don't know, sometimes this week, maybe you sat there in the store holding a gift longer than you should have, thinking, I don't know, are they going to like this, or is it going to be something that they're just, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know, if only I knew, right? It's, we can't see all that. It's uncertain. We don't know if that particular stock that we've taken a little beating on is going to skyrocket in 2013 or if it's going to plummet and we should sell it and take our loss now before the end of the year. We don't know. We can't see ahead to know if this is the day 
we should keep our children home from school because something horrible is going to happen there. See, life is foggy. That's why I love the Gospels. Because they're not about supermen and superwomen who get their morning briefing every day from God and they therefore know where, where to go and what to avoid. No, they're about real people. Real people who faced and struggled with uncertainty around every corner. As a matter of fact, the leading female role in the Christmas story, Mary, her role comes with several moments of agonizing uncertainty. And yet, this child that has been conceived in her by Almighty God, he is coming to make the most important things in life certain, absolutely certain. And so this morning, we're going to look at Mary a little bit, identify with her, and I hope understand why the Christmas message is like no State of the Union. It's like no CEO giving, you know, a state of the company. It's, it's entirely on a whole different level. So let's ask the Lord to speak to us. Almighty God, we come to you today, for we don't turn to the best thoughts of any human being. We come to you, the God whose thoughts are not our thoughts, whose ways are not our ways, to the God who is so matchless, so magnificent that our finiteness wrestles with your revelation. And yet there are things that you have revealed to us that are certain if we respond in faith. So we ask you to speak to us today. Lord, I have no idea every different heart and soul here today, and I don't want to know. I know my own. I don't know who has come here today just hanging on by a thread and who has no idea that the week ahead of them is going to Make them tumble. We bring our lives to you, Lord, in this moment. We ask you to speak to us, living God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Luke chapter 1, it's a passage of Scripture that you may have read many times, or maybe you have, were raised in a home where you didn't have a Bible. You don't know anything about the Christmas story in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, we read, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Engagement in that day was far different from ours. Uh, to break an engagement in their day, you had to get a legal divorce. Engagement was a guarantee of intended marriage. The angel comes in in verse 28, we read, and coming in, he said to her, hail favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I am a virgin, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was born called, called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bondslave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The angel comes to Mary and says, Hail Mary! Hail favored one! Listen! Listen! You have been selected by God to be the mother of the Messiah. 
What a surprise. Mary did not have on her iPhone, right, a, a, a visit with Gabriel today. She woke that day with a complete inability to see through the fog of life. She woke up that day with the complete inability to see through the fog of God's plan for her. The angel says, Mary, surprise, here's what you've been selected for. Back in November on election day, I voted over at the high school is the place where I vote. And um, Paula Barbin, one of our dear ones here in church, I don't know, I won't point her out, because but Paula is a, a, just a dear uh, individual, and she also works with the election bureau, board, or whatever, you know, here in Maple Shade. And so when I walked up, there was Paula, and there, I'm, I checked my name, there it was. I got to talk with Paula. It was really great to see her there. And I went into the booth to vote. And as I was voting for the Board of Education, there were three openings, and there were only two people that were running. I thought, huh. And I looked and I saw a, a button for write in. And for the first time in my life, I pushed that button right in. And the keyboard lit up. And I typed in Paula Barbin. <laughs> and I came out of the booth and she says, Good to see you, Pastor. I said, Yeah, by the way, I voted for you for Board of Education, right? She went, What? <laughs> And she's, you didn't. And I said, yeah, I did. We'll see. You know, we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens, you know, right? And her look on her face, right? It was great. She's not on the board of ed, but it was, you know, it was. But I remember the surprise on her face. Imagine Mary, all right? This is a young woman. And an angel appears to her and says, Mary, surprise, you've been selected to be the mother of the Son of God. And don't read it knowing the story. Read it as if you were her. Because she's not sitting there going, you know, I kind of thought it might have, I thought it might have been me. I, 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 I was, I, I, you know, I didn't want to say anything, but I kind of, you know, in my class, I've always thought, you know, nothing. She's, what us? can you imagine being told that? It's even harder for us because we haven't grown up in a Jewish home where they're looking for the Messiah, looking for the Messiah. Wow, what a message. Stunning. And we read along there, and in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And we begin, if, if, you're, if you're feeling with her, we begin to sense her trying to see through the fog. You've told me the announcement. Okay, I, I, how do I, it's still not a clear picture. They tell her, it's the Son of God that is going to be carried in her. And in verse 38, those words stand out to me, and the angel departed from her. The angel doesn't sit over there, right? Say, you know, this isn't, you know, like the movies. Don't worry, I'll always be here. You'll just, just look and see me or click your shoes or tap your hands. And the angel leaves, and it's Mary all by herself again. And, and it's, she doesn't get a chance to say, hang on, before you go. Now, are you telling Joseph this too? Are you letting other people know? Well, how's this, you know, what's happening here? No, the angel's gone. And amazing moments in our lives can often be followed with crashing uncertainty, right? My favorite, still my favorite, even though others have climbed the list of Christmas shows for me, you know, I still love Rudolph, and you say, well, that has nothing to do with the gospel story. I know, I know the gospel story, and it's anchored in, but, you know, that, it's just such a, such a childhood thing for me, right? And, and in there, Rudolph, when he's with, what's her name, Clarice or whatever? Oh, what, what a moment. And, and, and she says, Rudolph, I think you're cute. Woo! 
Oh, baby. She thinks I'm cute. And he is lit up and flying and all around. And the fact is, this is one of the greatest moments in his life. And he lands and that whatever pops off and there's the... That, you know, that noise, you know, and, and, and what happens? He immediately becomes an outcast. What? Um, from a moment of wow to absolute uncertainty. And I read that in there. Because I look at Mary, who has this incredible moment. And yet, what do we read in Matthew 1, we read Joseph doesn't know. As a matter of fact, there are certain things in the Gospels we have to put together. We've got to kind of be Columbo or, you know, whatever, you know, CSI or whatever. You, you know, we've got to kind of try and put the story together as it would seem. And as it would seem, because the Gospel writers don't tell us, it would appear that the only way Joseph finds out is that Mary somewhere has to tell Joseph. Because in Matthew chapter 1, there is Joseph not believing her, that this is somehow God. It's Joseph doing, having to respond to her, uh, if, if you want to turn there, but you may well know the words in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. See, it, but imagine, but before that, before he even makes the decision, Mary knows, but now how, God hasn't told Joseph, how can you imagine that sense of struggle and uncertainty? How do I tell the man that I'm engaged to that God has placed a child within me? What is going to happen to her relationship with Joseph? Because from what I read in the angel's message, there was no guarantee that she wasn't going to be going through this alone. The angel didn't say to her, and you and Joseph. No, the angel just told her what she was going to experience. What's going to happen with this relationship? I can remember when Greta and I had dated in college and then, you know, I fell in love with her and sensed that she was feeling the same, but then we, she, we, we, she broke up and needed time and, and, and distance and we, I kind of tried to stay around her and I struggled with how do I give her distance while I don't want any other guy to see that distance, you know, and, I, and though there was those times in there and I can remember sitting at my cousin's wedding and, and, and sitting there at my cousin's wedding, Greta wasn't there and I remember watching my cousin get married and just saying, Lord, if you just said to me, don't worry, in five years, Greta's going to marry you, I'll be, okay, I just need to know. But it doesn't work that way, does it? No. We don't know. And we agonize. And some people agonize, is my marriage going to survive? And some people agonize, is, is my child going to turn back to the Lord? And some people agonize, is my workmate going to be honest about what happened and these relationships we agonize what's going to happen and Mary is facing uncertainty and there's 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 pain there there's some suffering because we live in a foggy world that's not all when you think about the uncertainty she went through if you look to Luke chapter 2 there's the simple uncertainty of their plans, right? I mean, we, we know that. We've read the story, and so it, it, it's, it's a little more cozy to us. But as we try and each time we read it, to read it again, what's happening to a woman who is nine months pregnant, we, you know, we assume. In verse 1, it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee. 
from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. It came about while they were there. The days were completed for her to give birth. And we picture her... Uh, there, you know, she can't see through the fog of this. We're, we're heading to Bethlehem. She has no idea what's awaiting her, right? There's nobody ahead, you know, getting the, the stable kind of fixed up nice. There's nothing, nothing like that going on, right? And it's a wonderful life, you know, when, when, when him and his wife are going to their wedding night, the old mansion, the friend, that she gets it all cozy and nice and they put some posters and it's not happening. There's, no, there's nobody seeing ahead on this. It's a man with a woman who's about to give cha- uh, birth traveling away from home. We live in a day and age of technology, and because of that, we eliminate some of that uncertainty. But we're fooling ourselves if we think technology just like, you know, we... Nowadays, we can just, we, you know, we're headed there, all right, I'm going to make certain what's going to happen there, right? I remember several years back when Greta and I were going on vacation. Before we had kids, we were going to Williamsburg, and I did my homework, because I don't always do my homework, but I did my homework, and I had us booked in the Sheraton there in Williamsburg. And I had, you know, I pulled up there as we were staying in a nice place and we're going in. And, and uh, I, I think I even, we even took our luggage out because I have a confirmation number in my hand. And we walked up to the, to the front desk and here we are, right? And there's my confirmation number. And I'm sorry, Mr. McDonald, we've overbooked our hotel and we've put you in another hotel. And I remember as we were driving out, I looked up at their big sign, and it said, the Sheraton welcomes the Northern Virginia Dental Association. I'm think, I said to Greta, some dentist is in my bed, right? You know, so, right? And, 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 and it didn't get any better because the hotel they put us in was kind of rinky-dink, and, uh, and we couldn't shut the air conditioner off, and it was freezing. I remember laying there just saying, there's a dentist in my bed, right? See, we can't make things certain. We live in a world of uncertainty. And we make plans. You know, those of you who are planning for weddings or whatnot, don't think, oh, what's he saying? You know what I'm saying. We make plans, but we we cannot make things certain. Mary couldn't see. Because life is foggy. Uncertain relationships and uncertain plans and uncertain safety. If you turn back to Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 2, shortly after the Lord Jesus, the King of Kings, is in human flesh. And in Matthew chapter 2, after the wise men come, and what a day, what a day for Mary and Joseph. These wise men come and When they leave, Mary and Joseph probably have more wealth than they've ever had, right? When those wise men leave, Mary and Joseph have to be looking at each other saying, wow, I've never seen, you know, all all this stuff, right? I've never seen all that they've brought us. I've never seen some of this, the, 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 the wealth that... Wealthy items that they've brought to us here. I could even in my mind, I'm not speaking inspiration, but I could even in my mind picture Mary as they're settling down to go to sleep saying, oh, I just wish this day never ended. What a wonderful day this has been. And if she said that, she had no idea how dramatic that statement really was. Because what happens in verse 13, when the wise men departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there was until the death of Herod that 
what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. My point is this, there is Joseph and Mary woken up at night, oh, startled at night. There is Joseph and Mary wrapping up Jesus, running in terror from a crazed killer. There are Joseph and Mary aware that an evil, crazy person is coming to kill their son, and there they are trying to hide him. I remember listening last week to an FBI specialist as he was talking after the Sandy Hook events. He was saying, we want to do and constantly learn and do all that we can to improve security. But he made this statement that he said, I cringe every time I hear a politician say, we've got to make sure this never happens again. He said, because they don't realize they are creating unrealistic expectations. He said, those of us in the security field know this. Security is not about guaranteeing safety. It's about delaying danger. Think about that. He said, we in the field know we cannot guarantee safety. All we can do is try to delay danger so that support can arrive. So that a defense can be formed. He said, we cannot guarantee safety. Life is foggy. It's uncertain. We can't just say, I'm going to just lock the doors and stay in the house because you have no idea if that house is going to be standing at the end of the day that you have kept yourself safely locked in. It's uncertain. Even in moments when we are rejoicing. The movie, While You Were Sleeping, I love that movie too because it's, you know, it has a Christmas surroundings in it. And in that movie, there is one of the sons, Peter, who's in a coma and they get mixed up thinking this girl's his fiance and all. But then there's the other son, Jack. And Jack's a good guy and he's... And he's been working with his dad in the family business, but he's also building furniture on the side, and that's really what he loves to do, and he's trying to figure out, how do I tell my dad this business that he has, you know, been doing and wants to pass on to his son? I don't want it. And it's like the day after Christmas or something, and he sits down with his dad, and his dad says this to him, you you know, you work hard. You try to provide for your family, and then for one minute, everything's good. Everyone's well. Everyone's happy. And in that one minute, you have peace. And Jack looks at his dad and says, Pop, this isn't that minute, right? (laughs) Am I saying to you that we should walk around in life going, okay, I don't want to be happy because who knows what? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. As a matter of fact, everything turns on what I say next. (laughs) That we struggle with this foggy life and this uncertain world we live in. But in that life, Mary brought forth a son and he came with absolute certainty about two things. The first is this, eternal life. Eternal life. Because when you look at Luke, what did the angel say to her there in chapter 1, in case you missed it when I said it the first time? As the angel is talking to Mary in Luke 1 and verse 31, she says, You will conceive in your womb and will bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. means Savior, right? Salvation. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And look at this. And his kingdom will have no end. A 
couple weeks ago, I was talking with Hannah Conaby. Hannah Conaby, what a precious individual. And I've just been, you know, Hannah, I've had a chance to kind of be alongside coaching her at different times. And Hannah is, is a tremendous athlete, tremendous athlete. But she's also a tremendous person, loves the Lord. And, and I, I, I've been just looking forward to, Hannah's on the, the uh, varsity basketball team, the, the team for Grove City College. And she, I was just looking forward to seeing her. Each year she's gotten more time. I'm, oh, I want to just see her this year. So uh, do well. And I was talking to her and she said, yeah, uh, uh, something happened in my knee. And I'm saying, okay, yeah. And so and she, you know, my season's over. And I just went, your season's over. I just felt such a, oh, for her. She smiled. I, well, who knows what the Lord's doing. But for me, I'm, oh, right? Because sometimes our sports season ends unexpectedly. Sometimes our job comes to an end unexpectedly. Sometimes far worse. And our hearts continue to ache for parents whose children's lives came to an end in first grade. To our shattered world, to lives that are in the grips of uncertain relationships, uncertain plans, uncertain safety, listen to those words again. His kingdom shall have no end. No end. Jesus Christ came to this earth for broken, uncertain, devastated human lives. And he came, and when Jesus walked this earth, this is what he said about himself. He said, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me will have everlasting life. And they shall not come into judgment because they have already passed from death to life. That's what he says. John tells us in his last parts of 1 John, he says this, I write these things to those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus Christ came to a world of dying, broken people whose lives are vulnerable and insecure and foggy and uncertain, and he came with a clear message. I want to make this certain for you. You can know when your life on this earth is over that you will continue living forever. You can have everlasting life through faith in him. His kingdom has no end. You can know that you will live with him forever. And the scripture is so clear. The gospel messages is so clear that the wages of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, that we can come uncertain about our job, uncertain about our relationships, uncertain about our safety. We can come and say to him, we are certain about this. You are the savior of the world and you died in our place Forgive me, O oh God, and give me everlasting life. And you can be certain that you will never, ever die. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Whoever lives and believes in me will never really die. Whew. I want to change that Christmas hymn from the first Noel to the first no end. And I want to look into the eyes of Bob Strong's loved ones and Joan Snyder's loved ones and Elmer Horton's loved ones and Dave Griffith's loved ones. And I want to say, no end, no end, no end, no end, right? No end. It's never going to end. Whew. Hallelujah. Jesus makes one other thing certain, and I know I need to close. Not only is an eternal life, but it's an eternal presence. Because the angel said to Matthew, now listen, his name's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus made sure that Mary understood, that they understood, his followers understood. It's not like Mary when the angel was there and the angel left. Jesus said, listen to me, I will never 
leave you. Never. You will never, ever be alone. I will be with you always. Always. Think about that Christmas message. To those of us we know, we don't know. We're uncertain if what's, what awaits us when we leave here today. But we know this. I have everlasting life with a Savior who is with me now and always will be. Whew. I'll never forget the story I read in the Book of Virtues. Uh, William Bennett writes it. It was a story, evidently a true life story, because there were names in it, of two American soldiers fighting over in France during World War II, and they were in the same company. They were brothers. And the one soldier was taken down by a German bullet. And his brother, seeing him there, lying in the middle of the battlefield, said to his commanding officer, let me go get my brother. And his officer said, no. No, your life is in my hands. I cannot allow you. Your brother's probably dead. I'm not going to risk your life. And the brother continued to plead, please, please. And the officer relented. Whether it was against policy or not, the officer relented and allowed the brother to go out and retrieve his brother's body. And he did. He crawled out and, and kind of put his brother's body on his back and crawled back. And when he brought the body back, his, his brother was dead. And the officer said, see, see you, you risked your life for nothing. And the brother said, you're wrong. When I got up to my brother and put my arm around him, he looked at me and he said, Tom... I knew you would come for me. Whew. He's here with you. I don't know what you're facing. I, can, I, don't, I don't confess to know the depth of the pain that some of you carry. He will never leave you or forsake you. No end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your promise. Lord, I pray in this moment that anyone here whose heart, Lord, you have been knocking on, and in this quiet moment, they might turn to you and say, oh God, I don't want to be uncertain about death anymore. God, I believe that Jesus died to pay the price for my sin. Oh God, forgive me, I put all my faith in him. Lord, let hearts pray that to you right now. Lord, save me. Make me your child forever. And Lord, I don't know who here today may be wrestling with uncertainty in, in some of their relationships. Uncertainty in their plans. Uncertainty in their safety. Help us to find comfort in hearing your words, that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.